My name is Andrew Zaslaid and I'm audiophobe. And that means it's something I seem to be developing over the years that we're all supposed to be audiophiles here, but then you listen to the music and you're like, I can hear this tack. Well, I think you're compressing, you should reposition your speakers or have a better wires. So year on and year on, it becomes more and more about audiophobia rather than enjoying the music. So I'm now, after 20 years, a certified audiophobe, I guess. Uh, I've been doing electronics design for most part of my life. I've been living in Altium Designer since it was still called Protel and 98 or 99 or something like that. Uh, started in Silicon Valley, been doing all kinds of different design for different people, mostly for the companies you never heard because they all wanted to get rich and then run out of cash and shut them, shut them down. So the typical subcontraction, subcontraction job is, but the good thing is that it lets you see life from the different angles and you learn a lot from your customers' mistakes and, and from your own. Uh, I've been building tube amplifiers as a hobby for a good part of my life, just to counterbalance all the logic gates I've been seeing on the screen for a while, so I thought that I'll do something totally different for the hobby. And for the last four years, I'm CTO and a designer for the speaker company called Estelon. So these puppies are what I do for a living. These are the most spectacular ones that we produce, about 280 kilos each. And uh, I still have an audio hobby, that's the underground club I'm running with my friends and I maintain this wall, which sound-wise is actually pretty nice considering that each of those have different crossover, but, but I've been getting a hard time of positioning them next to each other so that they are somewhat face coherent. By the way, it has so low Q factor that you can go with the microphone in front of it and yell and nothing goes to feedback. So it's a great system. It's so bad that it doesn't even generate, but somehow with the electronic music, nobody seems to care. So, uh, looking at the faces, I'm pretty familiar that I'm repeating the obvious here, but just to get everybody on the same page, this is the classic class D amplifier design as you as you all used to it and um, it's a analog part then you get the sawtooth then you have a comparator and then after comparing it you will get the pulse width modulated signal obviously and at the end you will be switching a bridge with it um, most of the amps have some sort of feedback connected to it because otherwise you will be not able to get precise enough signaling. And what's wrong with it is that it's imprecise. And it's imprecise in a sense that uh, even if you feed a digital signal to that, I think about 80% of the Class D amplifiers, what they do, they are immediately converting it to analog just to have this poor comparator in the middle and to do that comparison they on the other hand they are not very fast either so most of the class D amplifiers have classically been run with something about I, I remember a couple of years ago IRF was very proud at the CES saying that we are now doing 800 kilohertz fed bridge for support for the for the class D amplifiers which is a big deal considering that we used to switch at 400 for most of the time but but it is still ridiculously slow if we think about what phase angles we're really after. So, so the classic class D, I think, fails at the point where you have right at the beginning this comparison part. Uh, there is also the problem that if we use the analog PVM or even if we don't use analog PVM, if, even if we use the mathematical simulation of the PVM and uh, some sort of, of FPGA or whatever chip we use, uh, we still have this problem that it has no granularity or it has very poor granularity in the sense that the PVM varies and if there is additional jitter, this is almost impossible to correct digitally because it was meant to be jittering in the first place. So it's not even an... You, you can imagine there's a term called aperture jitter, which is where zero becomes the one. And now we have the sawtooth, which is all about creating this aperture jitter. So it, it, it moves around like crazy. And um, 
And partially, you, that's the reason why you have to have relatively low switching rates, because when you have fast switching rate with large jitter, your jitter becomes predominant to the signal more and more and more the faster you switch. So at the end, if you go several hundred mega, well, several megahertz, then, then your jitter becomes more and more problem. To stating more obvious things to the audience, uh, let's go over what the PVM and, oh, I made that wrong. That's a PVM, not PDM. Uh, uh, let's go over what the pulse width modulation is then. We are basically having a sawtooth carrier wave. We have a sine wave or whatever audio signal there is. And we basically switch the pulse on and off every time the sine wave becomes equal with the sort of signal. So we are decoding this analog with the carrier. That's what exactly happening on this comparator part. And then we end up with a signal. Well, that's all nice. So what is the PDM then? The pulse density modulation, we do it differently. We don't change the pulse width, but we change the pulse density. We go for it's, it's basically like kicking the signal every time. So if you're not familiar with it, it's a very simple concept. At a very high rate, we just tell the signal up, 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 down, 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 up, down, up, 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 down. So we like trying to move a pencil one pixel at a time. And if we do that very quickly, then we'll end up having a audio signal representation. That's Obvious as well, great, if you, if you look at this this way. So if we compare the PCM to the BDM then, we're talking about pulse width modulation here, so don't get confused. Now we're comparing the pulse density with the PCM, pulse coded modulation. Then here we have, on the pulse density modulation, we have this one bit going up, 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 down, 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 up, down, up, down, very fast. On the... PCM, we have a level represented to us. If it's 24-bit, we have granularity like that. If it's 32-bit, well, this picture shows it's also more, more granular, but, uh, but basically we have just more levels here. So it seems that um, pulse density modulation in infer is inferior to the PCM because, well, we only have one level. But in fact, that very fast sampling rate, what we have for the pulse density modulation, helps us to acquire one thing which is difficult to have with a 44 kilobit or kilohertz or, or 96 kilohertz even sometimes uh, PCM signal because it has some phase information. What we don't get if we're using the 16 bit or whatever bit, 44 kilohertz PCM, because we just don't sample it often enough. So we sample it at certain points, but there will be, to some level, inaccuracy on the phase. And there are flame wars in internet going on for the last 10 or 20 years, why one is better or worse than another. I don't want to take sides, but I like PDM much, much more, because I am a strong believer that the human here is quite, human air is quite uh, insensitive if you look at the spectrum, but human air is ridiculously good instrument if we consider how its phase accuracy is. You will be able to point, if you're a little bit trained, you're able to point the sound source with closed eyes at some frequencies up to one degree. That is a megahertz range timing difference between left and right ear. It's also that you will be able to position if the sound source is in front of you or in back of you by how it reflects from your air lobe. So our brains are used to decoding the phase information. What's happening on the frequency domain is, I wouldn't say it's not that important, but it's certainly less accurate on the amplitude domain than it is on the phase domain. And I think that's one of the reasons why high bitrate stuff, besides all the technical problems of filtering, uh, uh, the brick walling and stuff like that, and the phase and ringing of the filters, I think that's one of the reasons why high bitrate formats always sound better to the air, because they don't lose that information. 
it becomes even more of an issue if we try to get back analog signal from the digital one. Um, I don't know, I'm sorry if somebody recognizes the drawings because I shamelessly copied it all off the internet and it was too difficult to credit everything. So please do claim your credit if you see a familiar picture. Uh, the PCM, there's a classic resistor ladder configuration which kind of gives you an idea how each bit represents to the analog. So we have a slow bit rate, but each bit represents the certain level of the signal and that uh, allows us to reconstruct the analog waveform from the relatively slow uh, sample rate by Nyquist theorem it's basically we can generate the analog signal if the sampling rate is twice the uh, twice the, the filtered signal frequency which is not always true actually because we can only construct part of the signal but 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 anyway complicated way with the PTM, it's a really simple way. The fundamental property of the pulse density modulation is that you can reconstruct analog signal by just filtering it, period. So if you have to see all the fancy fancy DSD DACs would say that we do bazillion things to the DSD just to get it analog, some of it is probably justified, but you don't have to do that. You can just get away with just simple low-pass filter or, or have your speakers filtering this uh, if you don't worry about all kinds of interference. And your PDM modulation comes analog just naturally by laws of physics. Well, laws of physics are there as well, but it's more complicated because you're combining a lot, uh, a lot of signals with um, relatively low phase accuracy. And this is where it gets interesting. The DST, which everybody has been talking for several years, is a pure PDM modulation. The Super Audio CD uses DST. DST is just a fancy new name for what was used in the Super Audio CD for 20 years. That's the same modulation scheme, same frequencies, everything is the same. And there are zillions of class D amplifiers which have struggled over the years to get the good modulator straight so that you would have a nice digital amplifier. So from one end you have a disk which has perfect modulation on it. You don't have to do anything, just feed it to something and drive your bridge with it and it works. And on the other hand we try to decode and do whatever we please to that to get it back to analog. So, so why not use the DST signal directly for driving your speaker with just the bridge in between. Just the same bits go to the, go to the bridge and we can modulate the speaker diaphragm without having anything in between. Just, just pure bits. And so, lo and behold, sharp somewhere at 2000 decided that, yep, that's a good idea. Let's try to do that. And introduced something which was way ahead of its time. It was, everybody who had used it claimed that it's a spectacular amplifier, that it works better than, better than anything. And Sharp had a really simple concept. They decided that if we take the super audio CD stream, super audio was just about getting hot, so everybody had the players, that if we get the same one bit bit stream and we feed it directly to the amplifier, we're done. We can have this, what I just talked about, one bit without any problems going to the speaker. And what Sharp was obviously after for was that, okay, that's, We'll come to that later. What Sharp was after was to have a sound chain as pure as possible. So if you see it has analog input, it has a delta sigma modulator, but you can bypass it if you use a super audio CD. So it, the amplifier came paired with a specific super audio CD player which had a bit stream going with a wire. They had their Delta Sigma modulator and they had a bridge and nothing else, just the filters. So exactly the topology what you would 
imagine would work. They went through a great deal of pain during it. They developed, and these were back the times where every equipment came with the service manual, so you have schematics and everything freely available. This is just a copy and paste from their service manual. They spent, I don't know how much time and power to develop a seventh order Delta Sigma modulator in ASIC, which was back in 2000, if you, if you know signal processing, the seventh order Delta Sigma is quite a bit to do. So, so somebody went through the pain. It must have been like five year project to get this ASIC right and, and to get this working. And then they had to switch that Delta Sigma modulation with 2.8 megahertz, which back in 2000 wasn't that easy to do accurately at voltages of 50, 70 volts. They're using IRF 550s here. The Sharp introduced their amplifier late 2000. The IRF 530 MOSFET came to the market 2001, is the earliest data sheet I'm able to find. So, so they must have been experimenting with it a couple of years before IRF even introduced it officially. So they were so greenfield as you can get with that technology. And yet, have anybody heard about Sharp DST amplifiers today or that they've ever existed? So, yeah, I know, you last time told that you know that, but, <laughs> but you are so far the only person who knows that that exists. <laughs> so, so nobody, it's, it's a totally forgotten technology, and Sharp, with their development team, went lower and lower in the consumer's chain. So, somewhere at 2005, 6, 7, they introduced a small tabletop, literally like clock radio, having a probably one of the first finest digitally switching amps connected to the mini disc and that was consumer the the S6100 costed 15 16000 dollars back then which was in 2000 it was a huge amount of money the tabletop systems were not that expensive and you can get one around 100 bucks at the moment in the eBay or places. I think they are still one of the most spectacular pieces of the engineering that had been done to the audio in 2000s Yet, you hear nothing of them. So. And what happened was this. It is incredibly difficult to do a 60 or 70 volt perfect square wave at 2.8 megahertz without blowing the rest of your circuit haywire. This is the actual scope picture. This is my picture from the very early experiments we, we done with specific FETs. That's a five nanosecond division. So what kills you is that if you look at the FETs, it seems that everybody's switching. We have processors going to gigahertz range. So why would be 2.8 megahertz difficult? Well, processors work at 0.8 point something volts today just to have this fast switching. If we switch about 70 volts, then your FET starts to behave totally differently. Your internal capacitance of the FET becomes a huge issue. And the damn thing doesn't switch off. That's the switch of characteristics of, this, of the FET. You, you'll have a jitter as hell. And there are like a handful of FETs which can do that today. Even today, when we started the project, I went through whole diggy key to find those vets. I found two that suit my need. And out of two, one was out of production already. So it's, there is, at least to my knowledge at the moment, there is one MOSFET which has a controlled leading edge or the, or the switch of waveform and, and uh, at the varying load conditions. With 50-50 duty cycle, they work perfectly. You will have like a picosecond accuracy. Put a varying load there, like audio does, because you're going with an analog modulation, and you start your you start your tra trailing edge of the switching waveform go like crazy. So why not? This is what happens, and it's. 
it's mixed signal design at its worst. You will have on one end the PDM signal, which is not very efficient because it's a 50% modulation at, at best. At full steam, you still don't get more than 50% of the efficiency. And since you switch very fast, it means that your switching losses are becoming at the same magnitude as your uh, losses on the conduction, which means that you will have it heating up even if running on idle. It becomes actually more efficient if you run more current through it because the ratio changes. You have still same switching losses about because of the internal gate capacity and stuff like that. But, but, but on one end of the board, you try to switch a 80 volt waveform at 2.8 megahertz without ringing all over the place. On the other hand, in order to do that, the sigma delta modulation or delta sigma modulation and stuff, on the other end of the board, you'll have a huge bunch of CPUs running at gigahertz range, having their power drawn somewhere. And then somehow magically, what we want to do, we want to have a very quiet and very audio feel grade signal coming out of this whole thing by just low pass filtering it and telling, hey. So it's, it's, it's quite a lot of pain to go over to get that right. And I think if, if there's anybody in the room who knows why this project got killed in Sharp at the end, please do tell us because I have only speculation, but as, as I kind of think they were so leading edge on their design that they just couldn't handle it. I think they must have blown zillion MOSFETs during that production and, and I think they just finally gave up because they couldn't make any money. I think this uh, nice SX100 amplifier didn't cost a fortune because they wanted to make a lot of money out of it. I think if you look at it, it's basically m milled aluminum chassis where everything is embedded in its own place. Back in 2000, milling a huge aluminum block with a CNC wasn't that cheap affair. I think it must have costed them a couple of hundred, well, a couple of thousand dollars just to get the chassis done. And then, then all of the rest of it and the, the EMI issues and probably Sony was giving them hard time because Super Audio CD stream wasn't not meant to be grabbed, but they had it flying at the wire. So probably they had some issues with the legal department as well about it. Anyway. It died, or at least I haven't seen them producing any new units. But we now have about two decades worth of development. And why is it about the right time of doing it today is that, first of all, there is this DSD, the Super Audio CD format resurrected. And the good thing about it is that we have now a software which can do that. I mean, Yussi and its signalist company, HQ Player, praise the God, is an excellent DST modulator. That is, it does everything what, it, what needed, and Yussi is a very good at signal processing, so his seventh order asynchronous DST or asynchronous delta sigma modulation, everybody likes it. It sounds good, it has all the correct things done to it, so we have software modulator, which we didn't have back in 2000. Like I said, Sharp had to create a special chip for that. And I, considering how much floating point calculations the correct delta sigma modulation actually does, I think they had to cut a lot of corners to get that working because I see, well, back in 2000, we were at Vertex 5. We could hardly simulate the 486 processor in FPGA. At the moment, when we use HQ player to do the real-time uh, PDM conversion at DST64, we use 90% of the quad-core Intel Jowl, which runs at 2.5 gigahertz. So I think we're talking about several orders of magnitude, more computing power than Sharp could have put on that ASIC. So, so they, they, they had to do a lot of compromises. So it probably wasn't sound-wise uh, at the end that good as they wanted it to be. Now we have, have embedded computer platforms which run at, I don't know, several gigahertz and have eight cores, so no problem. FET technology. Great leap forward. FETs we have today are much better than they used to be. I mean. Uh, they are still not perfect, but, 
but and and unfortunately there are reasons why uh, gallium nitride is not a very good choice i'm still hoping that i learn how to use that but uh, my experiments with gallium nitride have been failing uh, but there are good mosfets now which we can use for the very fast and very deterministic switching and it's kind of inevitable that we have to get this digital amplification now right because there is people are using tablets they want to stream they want to play from tidal and having a tidal DAC two power amplifiers it's a it's a nice hobby but sometimes you just want to listen to the music and and now the mandatory product placement Estelle on links, the speaker I've been working for the last two years. We've gone through about five different electronics versions just to get right the same things where, uh, where Sharp might have failed. And, and this is the self-contained speaker, which is streamer, which has built in Rune, which plays directly from Tidal. And it has the same HQ player embedded to convert everything to the DST on the fly. And we do use it as no DSP system. So if you look at the flowchart here, then we do have a Silinx which does subwoofer processing. And then we reclock it. But the upper part, the meets and highs, they go straight through the speaker crossover. We don't have any DSP there. So what it gives you is that you will be ending up with a Wi-Fi driven speaker, which represents the DSD recorded material bit perfect. You basically have nothing else than a low pass filter on front of it uh, because of trying to get rid of the phase uh, skew at the very high frequencies of audio. We are filtering it at very high frequency of somewhere close to megahertz and let the rest of the digital to analog conversion be done by the speaker itself. So I'm basically feeding the PDM, although slightly filtered, to the speaker elements directly without doing anything to it. And it gives you this extra, this gives you this extra couple of percents what you need to make a digital material sound great. So uh, it doesn't sound like analog, it doesn't sound like digital, it sounds something else. And if you measure it, it's not that good. It's uh, like, it measures more or less like your average tube amplifier. But it shares some characteristics of the tube amplification because its distortion is uh, mostly second order which means that you can have quite a lot of it without getting annoying and at some level even people start to like it more if it distorts because brain hooks to the second order distortions. So we do hardly nothing else than reclock the DSD data if it's born as a DSD. If it's born as a BCM, we go with uh, HQ player converting it with the seventh order delta sigma and then we go back to the not doing anything but just reclocking it to the stratum clock, which is about 300 femtoseconds in our case, to get it as precise as possible. And then we feed it to the bridge. So it's, it's quite straightforward architecture. What I'm calling it sometimes is uh, a software defined amplifier because most of the signal processing or most all signal processing is done uh, at the H uh, HQ player a little bit at the woofer filtering. It is connected with the Wi-Fi, so uh, we couldn't get away without having a separate radio channel to synchronize left and right, because otherwise Wi-Fi would give you the shift, random shift between the left and right channel. So there is a radio pulse which goes with a microsecond precision and then synchronizes the edges of the pulses on both sides, but that's, that's just something simple to keep them in sync. It has nothing to do with nothing to do with signals. There is one more thing what you can achieve if you use amplifier this way. We have two power supplies feeding the bridges, and if you want to change the volume, it becomes really easy. You don't have to do anything to the signal. You change the height of the pulses. So the volume control in 
uh, is actually analog. You will change your physically switching signal and it becomes a volume control. So that gives you a benefit that if you everything is in zero, d zero dB and you want to listen it uh, you want to listen it in the middle of the night at minus 15 dB, you don't lose any resolution. You will still have the same resolution, same bits going, each bit just making less sense to the, to the speaker and that's it. So it's a, it's a technology with what uh, I've been now intimately involved for the last four years, first two years trying to learn how to do it. I think if I would have known that Sharp has already tried and not on the market, I would have tried to talk everybody out of it, but I didn't. I discovered only S6100 two years ago, I think. No, even less, one and a half years ago. Anyway, we had the first version of Lynx Electronics already done when I realized that I invented a wheel here, but it was so well kept sacred that, that nobody knew. And, and you can't even find patterns. For some reason, Sharp, I, I thought that there would be expired, but I think even back then the technology was considered something which was difficult to patent because, uh, because uh, you see a lot of patents how they do specific things, but there is no generic patent, let's feed Super Audio CD to the speaker. No, it was probably considered like, how, how about putting a egg in the pie or something like that? Yeah, of course, you put egg in the pie, you get the pie. Well, What's the trouble? So, so we've been trying to publish all the information about it, and 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 and, and just just hoping that the technology catches up because it is worth of uh, worth of try if you listen if you listen to this, and uh, just a more product placement F two sixteen Estelon booth. We have the links is playing there, so I'm doing demo with them every every other hour. And if I'm not doing the demos, just come by and, and I will do a demo. Uh, you you will hear how the how the signal how how digital music sounds if you don't mess it up. So even the CD quality tracks and the title, they are they are pretty good. And that concludes the official part of it. So.